I gave you the whole Lawrence Brown part two end game stuff. And you gave me that, <laughs> you gave me that super lame intro, dude. You got I thought that was <laughs> quite professional, sir. This is not that kind of show. We don't need any of that professional crap. <laughs> the end game. That was actually pretty good. I got to admit. That was, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> so I have to practice on that. <laughs> yeah. Let's get on that, Mr. Voiceover Professional. <laughs> you got it. You got it. All right. I think you mentioned something on the work ethic bit, and I never really paid much attention to that. It was just how I am. Mm -hmm. Like people get freaked out because my hair is constantly on fire about everything. Like everything has to get done now. There's, there's an element of my wiring where I can operate in theory for a period of time. And then there is a hard cutoff where my operating instinct in theory, my patience for it runs out yeah. because I have to like, okay, this sounds good. Let's do something with it and let's see where we can take it and see whether it'll work or not. It's part of the reasons why I would never be able to be successful in academia because all of that is always wrapped up in theory and you don't really get to the execution bit. It, yeah. it, it would be the ninth circle of hell for me to be in academia. And mm -hmm. hopefully I'm not like screwing any future job prospects, but it depends on the environment that you're in. And I think there's always an opportunity. For example, when you think about the schools and the programs that are uh, forward thinking, right? Of course, all of the schools that people that come to mind that, that do that. I think there's that opportunity there, but I would say, yes, there's definitely a different pace and academia of getting things done for sure. Yeah. To the point of work ethic, again, you talk about form formative lessons. Yeah. I learned all this stuff from my mom. You had a mom that worked like crazy. My mom was a nurse and she worked like three jobs. Mm -hmm. And basically there were multiple periods in, in our lives or in my life as a kid where it was her work rate that kept the family afloat. Mm -hmm. Because there, there were some dumb business decisions that my dad made that my mom through her work rate as a nurse kept the family afloat. And mm -hmm. I learned how you should throw yourself into things, into work from her. Now mm -hmm. I'm not going to make any sort of judgments on whether that's healthy or not, because that's a different thing, Yeah, but I've always had this aspect of myself where if I believe in a thing to the point where I'm going to invest my time in it, I am going to attack it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's textbook burning the candle at both ends. Yeah. Whatever it is that you're trying to do, it's not worth doing it. If you're going to put 50% effort against it, that's right. just, that's not worth my time. So how do you, how do you think that that has shaped your career and shaped your thinking around leadership and teams? That's a really good question. I think it's probably irritated and annoyed a lot more people than it, uh, <laughs> than it's uh, ingratiated myself to because the loop didn't close until more recently where one of the leaders I work with mentioned, look, there's three ways that you can win in life in anything that you do. You can out, outwork, outsmart or outlast. Mm -hmm. I had zero interest in outlast. Because outlasting means that you were probably treading water long enough till the high performers got tired of being there in an environment that tolerated mediocrity and then the mm -hmm. low performers just weeded themselves out. So if you stayed mediocre long enough, and I know this sounds terrible, but if you stay mediocre long enough, your time to step up will come and then you just reap the benefits of everything else that happened before you actually took the seat. To some degree, we've actually, we've seen that. We know firsthand and have seen it because I know in the environment that we were in, we, we saw some of that. Yeah. And that goes to the point that I was saying is that the work rate from a career trajectory perspective, it's, I wouldn't go so far as saying people perceive me as some sort of force of nature because I'm not like that far out, mm -hmm. but it's, if you're constant, like I can't run a six minute mile, but I work like I'm trying to run a six minute mile. And a six minute mile with my short legs, that's pretty fast. So that's kind of my work rate. And you'd, you'd always get the comments about, oh, this is the guy that's going to throw off the curve and who's he trying to impress and all this sort of stuff. And I've always been the type of person that regardless of my title, regardless of my role, 
I'm going to behave from the looks part to the execution part as if I'm in the job that I want to be in. So even if I'm a car prep, I'm going to behave and act in a manner that's representative of somebody that is three, four, five levels above me right. because they just seems like the right thing to do. One of the biggest irritations that I've had throughout my career is when right or wrong is when people have, have taken the posture of this is above or below my pay grade. And when I look at leadership principles, a fundamental principle of leadership is you never ask your people to do something that you're not willing to do. And I live that. And yeah. you were one of the first people that I met who was a leader that, that lived that we knew so many people in that world. Mm -hmm. I would give lip service to that. And then you sure. try to track them down on a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Might like, not find them. People talk about getting ghosted. We were getting ghosted before ghosting was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no doubt. That's another back in the, back in our day conversation for the people, for the younger people in the audience. Yeah, absolutely. So when you think about it, we both have uh, strong personalities, right? What's been the reaction to the strong personality in terms of career trajectory, for example? This is the area of growth for me, because I probably spent, I don't know, a good 20 years mm -hmm. of my professional career, not really caring how I impacted somebody else. Yeah. So you, you talk about in your profile that we did, you talk about your wiring about, Hey, I had my goals in mind and I drove at it and I went after it. Like I was the same way, except I didn't have the nuance. I had an edge and I honestly didn't care at that time. If you got irritated with my work rate and my drive to achieve, that's not my problem. That's your problem. Now, <laughs> my, my mouth saying, would say stuff like that out loud, not knowing all of that stuff about, Hey, it's fine if you can produce, but if you're not building relationships and building a tribe of people that will advocate for you, there's, you're going to be limited in how high you can get. So I was mm -hmm. never politically savvy and I still struggle with the political savvy of those things. Because I'm one of those true believers. I join organizations and I evaluate them on their mission, vision, values. And if that aligns with me, then I'm all in. And where I get frustrated is if I'm executing in alignment with mission, vision, values, and I see that other people aren't, I will question that stuff out loud. And that doesn't engender me a lot of friends. But that stuff matters. I've never been in a place to go through the motions. It's not worth it to me. The pandemic has taught this lesson to a lot of people, but I knew it well beforehand mm -hmm. that you could drop dead tomorrow. If that happens, how are people going to remember you? Are they going to remember you as some sort of middle ground loafer, or are they going to remember you as somebody that just got after it and tried to, I think the phrase that I'm looking for is impose their will. Mm -hmm on the world to get it to change. And that sounds like really crazy. There's a quote about the world moves forward because of unreasonable men. And to use an inclusive version of that, unreasonable people. It's unreasonable people who are unwilling to accept the world as it is right. that makes the world move forward. And I'm not doing any like grand big thing like that, but that's the mindset that I have. Yeah. And it's, that's what drives me. And when I see misalignment in those areas, it, it gets me frustrated and it gets me questioning out loud mm -hmm. when I'd probably be better off. And this is directly from my mom because she doesn't shut up either. Sometimes I just need to be quiet and I'd be better served if I was, but I, I haven't quite figured that out yet. Shocker. You bring up some good points. So when you think about the part about the, the quiet. I think it could be the framing of it too. So I think quiet has a connotation oftentimes where, because I, I say this frequently that people oftentimes mistake kindness for weakness, or I would replace that with quiet because I think I mentioned about being someone who's introverted. But the reality is that for me, in that, in that quiet, I'm preparing and I'm planning for, for lack of a better description, the strike when I have evaluated what I needed to evaluate and make that, make that decision. 
And I've learned that over the years. So I think that's a little bit of what you're saying is, is that you're still not at the point yet where you're like the waiting and the watching. You're like, it's just keep moving, keep moving forward. And I wonder, you talked a little bit about this, but as far as how you've developed your teams and developed successful teams and how you've had the ability to drive these different outcomes, I would imagine that that has played uh, a part in being able to do that. I don't know how much of that is me. I look through my career across a number of different roles. And I think I've been really lucky to be surrounded by people who eventually are of like mind. My default is to speak in big terms and a growth area for me is to take that vision part and put it into like the, the stepwise mm -hmm. components. Like I'm not comfortable operating there, but I've gotten a lot better there. But if you're looking at a default driver, I always talk about, talk with people that I hire about what is it that you want and what is it that you can attack with a single-minded purpose and unrelenting fury. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that, that's my approach to life. How do I attack this with a single-minded purpose and unrelenting fury? Mm -hmm. And that's my expectation with anybody on the team want it more than you. That's when we, we heart have conflict within my teams. Ideally, my job is to get things out of the way so you can attack the things that you want and pursue the things that you want with that level of intensity, because it's the pursuit that is, that lays the groundwork for achievement. Like without the pursuit, you're not going to achieve. How have you managed to manage the folks that may have that drive, but in a, in a different way. Wow. That's a tough one for me to answer. I struggle with that. I try my best to figure out what's important to that person in terms of what they want to achieve and then roadmap how the seat that you're in is a pathway to get there. Yeah. So it's again, just like what I do on the, when I'm out there in the world doing my job, how do I figure out what's important to that person? and tie that to the solution that I offer. That's the gist of it. It's just internal, external, it, instead of externally focusing that, it's internally focusing that. Where that comes into conflict is if your stated desires don't mirror your um, your day-to-day -day execution. If you say you want this, but you're not willing to do the work, that's where I run into having problems with people and have to manage that aspect of it. If I'm spending that much time and pushing you towards something that you want, it's probably a function of you're not in the right seat or you're not in the right function to allow you to get there. What's challenging for me is that when I hire people, I'm all in on them. And it's tough for me to have that separation con conversation because I, I look for those glimmers and I latch onto those glimmers of achievement as a signal to, hey, this person is getting it when you know, more often than not, it tends to be a dead cat bounce. So I, I think that that actually speaks to, again, one of the, one of the elements that we that, you know, of leadership is reaching folks that, so oftentimes I, I think about when we think of diversity, we think of it from a, from an ethnic standpoint, we think about it from a gender standpoint, we think about it from a sexual orientation standpoint, but I think there's also the element of neurodiversity, right? And I think that we're both great examples of it. When we talk about our sense of drive, I would say you're probably definitely more of an extrovert than I, but it's interesting because though you are extroverted and I'm introverted, we have had this bond for many years. And I think one of the, one of the core elements is, is that we know that we're both driven to achieve. We're both driven to develop others. We're both driven by learning information and then sharing it out. We've talked literally for, you know, hours on end about the books that we read or what's happening in our lives, which is a segue because of the question that I have for you next is that when you think about, when you think about your career, what prides you the most about your career? What have you done that you say, yeah, I, I think that this is something that that drives me to continue to do what I do. I think in any one of the roles that I've been in where I've led a team, I've had somebody on the team get recognized at a group or national level. Mm -hmm. So when we were early in the career in two different divisions, I had people that were on my team that 
got recognized on a regular basis for individual accomplishments on the, on the matrix. Then when I switched divisions, I was part of a division that won an exceptional achievement award. And then I had myself as a, a as an individual contributor win an award. And then when I was in leadership, I had other people on my team win awards. And it's the biggest compliment that anybody can give me if they're on my team is if they end up being better than me in the same role. So that's pretty cool. Like my most recent role, I built a market from nothing to an $8 million business. And in the process of that, I had so many people that were new to the world of work or relatively new to the world of work or new to the industry. And I had multiple people win national awards rookie clubs and all that sort of stuff. I live for that stuff. I, honestly, like I've given away more deals in my desire to help people on my team to achieve the next tier on whatever it is that they're chasing. That stuff doesn't matter to me. Like another award, like I won awards all the time from the time I was a kid. It, my mom's a hoarder and she saved all of them. And I'm like, you still have all this stuff? Like they were those little eight by 12 or eight, eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper that we got back in the day. She had all of those things saved. Yeah. And me, I just got them and I was like, oh, whatever. But it's when my people win awards, that stuff is cool. So it goes back to one of the other things that you said. Yeah, we're both driven, but we also fundamentally realize that we're not going to get anything that we want to achieve unless we help other people get what they want. That's like a fundamental principle. I mean, it's part of the justification of why we're doing this show. How can we put in that career hack, the cheat code that helps other people get promoted faster and navigate these complex situations easier than what we went through. And part of it is going to be us telling our story, but most of it is going to be other people who have gone farther and climbed higher than we have telling what they went through and providing those cheat codes to the people that are coming up behind us. Yeah, that's an important element. I think it it correlates to the reasons why we are, I say pridefully, and I think you would agree, well-read, particularly in the space of leadership and leadership development and coaching and training and developing people, because part of that has been a driving force behind who we are and the guests that we have. It's exciting to be able to hear from the folks that we'll be bringing, because again, as you mentioned, the, the levels to which they've risen, the stories that they'll be able to tell will help others to be able to normalize some of the feelings that they may have, normalize some of the, uh, the issues they may be experiencing, and then learn like some of those cheat codes, right? Some of those hacks that will help them to maybe avoid some of the, like if they haven't gotten there yet, they can step around that particular landmine. Or if they have say, okay, well, at least I'm aware of what it is now, because it's extremely critical. Cause I think you talked about this too, is helping people and by helping them, you help to identify their blind spots and you help to identify what they may not see, like a real time 360 feedback by way of listening to others and their career trajectory. I mean, I look at it this way. There's got to be plenty of 20 something hard headed people just like me starting out in their world that are driven as hell. And they are oriented in a way where, look, I'm going to get mine and I don't care who I piss off to do it. That will take you a certain distance. Mm -hmm. But if you want to maximize where you can go, I wish Jim of today went back to 20 year old Jim and smacked him in the back of the head and yeah. said, Hey, listen here, dummy, <laughs> you got to cut that crap out. <laughs> yeah. I think the other part too is though, is also having that emotional intelligence to be aware. So that's part of the emotional intelligence of self-awareness, but understanding some of the other things. Because I think the other part, the other side of emotional intelligence, we didn't make this up. It's been out there for several years, <clears throat> is uh, really recognizing the management of self and then the management of others. And that's why I was asking the question earlier, because I think about this a lot, is that what may have impeded my career when I look back on it? And I don't look back on it like what impeded my career in the sense so that I can look forward now because I think that I have matured to a level where I feel pretty comfortable with taking on different uh, dynamics, but we're human and we still need reassessment oftentimes. But again, speaking on the level of what the show is going to do for other people is that I want to be able to say, hey, you certainly are a different person. You certainly may have a different outcome, but here's what I can share from you from a research standpoint. That's our research is so important, right? 
You can say definitively X number of people or based on the research. There's a reason that we say that it's because it helps to give us a benchmark, a framework to either say it's accurate or it's inaccurate, or I really don't care. I'm going to give it a try myself. And so it really is for everyone. It's for those that are truly driven. There are, there, it's for those that are introverted. It's for those middle of the road. And I think at all levels of development, because we'd love to hear from you, you know, regarding Jim's story, my story, and certainly the host that we're going to be having later in the show. And really at all levels, because we're talking about cascading leadership, right? So these are the cheat codes for the, where folks, to Jim's point, have progressed further than we have, is to pull out some of those cheat codes. And we'll hopefully have feedback from you all as well, from all levels of career. That's a great observation. One of the things that you mentioned was you have to have a certain level of EQ or emotional intelligence and self-awareness and all that sort of stuff. It, 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 in the moment, it got me thinking, well, maybe we should have some experts speak from that perspective too. And that might be oh, yeah. something that's useful, but I think this is going to be an ongoing conversation. We have a lot of interesting things planned. It's going to be a guest heavy focus, but there's going to be other things that we we're, we're planning on doing along the lines of leadership book reviews or what are you reading? Absolutely. And eventually if there's enough of an audience that's built out, I'd love to be able to do a live workshop of problem solving of something that's happening in your world of work that we need to, we need to troubleshoot and solve out. So there's a lot of different ways that we can approach it. And Hey, it's in some level when, once this gets out in the world, it's going to be an ask me anything type thing, where if there's a topic of interest that we want to explore, we can certainly find the guest to talk through it and make that happen too. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Jim. I think this is uh, this has been very informative. Anything else you'd like to leave us with? The, the, the big takeaway, the big learning for me, and it's still something that I have to fight against my default. My hair is constantly on fire and I, I operate as if I'm dropping dead tomorrow. And that's good to an extent, but you'll get further. If you make it a habit to slow yourself down, to, ha to allow others the space to think, breathe, and move towards you versus trying to push, pull, and drag them. So that's the big takeaway for me. It's still something that I'm working on because sometimes I just have to channel my inner Thanos and just say, fine, I'll just do it myself. <laughs> Another infinity war reference. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't know if we should share that, uh, we're, we're fans of, of more of the villains than the heroes sometimes, <laughs> hey, <laughs> cause I'm the, a huge Thanos, uh, the, and a huge Killmonger or the other Marvel reference. I think to go off into a nerd tangent, it, it's a lot more interesting in terms of personality studies to look at the villains versus looking at the heroes, because yeah. there's not really much texture to your garden variety hero in any comic book. Like out of all the comic books, probably the most textured hero is Batman. And he's not a Marvel guy, obviously. That's a complex dude, but like everybody else. <laughs>